In the last video, I've shown you what Numbers is capable of, how it is different from Excel and other spreadsheets, and why you shouldn't compare them. Of course, Numbers is mostly well known for its tables and charts, its most powerful features. I only briefly touched on them because it was important that you understood the different paradigm first, so you can use Numbers in more ways than currently thought of. But today, let's really dive deep into the tables module of Numbers. Remember that other than Excel, you can create multiple tables on a sheet and often you create an extra table for each separate unit of information. In Apple's own simple budget template, you can see that they use three tables, income, expenses, and money left over to show these three units of information. And like you can see in money left over, the sum of both tables, income and expenses are referenced. Don't worry, I will come to references soon. Now each table has rows, columns, and cells. The rows are labeled numerically, starting with one, and the columns are labeled with letters, starting with A. A cell is then referenced by the column letter and the row number. So the top left cell is called the A1 cell. The one to the right is called B1, and the one below is called A2, and so on. In Excel, you will see the headers of columns and rows all the time, while in numbers, they are hidden when you leave the table. At the right of the column header is the two line symbol where you can add or remove unused columns. The same symbol is at the bottom of the row headers. Here you can add more rows or remove unused ones. Note that you can't remove rows or columns which have data in its cells. The top left symbol, the circle icon, is the table selector. With it you can select the complete table to delete it, move it or perform various table actions. In the format menu you have different actions depending on whether you've selected a table, a row or columns or a cell or several of those. To create a new table, you go to the object toolbar at the top and select one of the templates. I usually pick the top left one. You can delete a table by clicking on the top left icon, the circle or table selector, and select delete. Once the table is selected, you can either delete it by pressing backspace on a Mac or selecting delete from the context menu on iPad or iOS. You can add rows or columns at the end by dragging the two lines icon. You can also add columns and rows by right clicking on a column or row header and selecting add or remove row above or below or column before and after. Cells can be selected either by dragging and clicking with a mouse over one or more selected cells or by holding the command key while clicking on cells, you can select non-adjacent cells. Each element of a table, table, row, column, individual cell or group of cells has a specific reference address. The full reference address for a cell would be sheet name, colon, colon, table name, colon, colon, column name, space, row name. Often you don't need to give the full name though. If a table in the document has a unique name, the sheet name is not needed. If the combination column name and row name is unique, then even the table name is not needed. You should, however, note that numbers cannot reference cells outside of the current document, other than Excel. So you can only reference cells within a numbers document. So about the names. The sheet name can be set during creation of a sheet or right-clicking on the sheet selector and selecting rename. The table name is a title on top of the table. This can be hidden in the format menu under the table tab. The column name is either the letter in the header or if you have a header row, then it is the name you enter in that row. In the simple budget example, you have a header row and a header column. So the column name for column A in the income table is money in. The row name is either the number in the header, or if you have a header column, then it is the number you enter in that column on that row. In the simple budget example, you also have a header column. So the row name for row four in the income table is total income. Note that you can use both names for rows and columns. In the example, the reference income colon colon B4 reference the same cell as income colon colon US dollar total income. If you take a look at the way numbers is handling the reference, you see that it automatically dropped the table name of income or expenses and US dollar income and US dollar expenses are unique names now. Also, you can see that if I remove the label US dollar in the header row of the table, that the calculation in the table of money left over would automatically change to the nomenclature of expenses, colon, colon, B8. Another thing you often see, especially with functions and calculations, is the use of the dollar sign in front of a row or header name. This designates that when copying this function to another location, that the row, column, or even both 
should not change. You can see in this example that I copied the calculation from cell C3 to D3, but it still gives me the value of B3 because I've frozen the cell reference using the dollar sign. In numbers, you can either type the address using dollar in front of either the row, the column, or both. Or you can click on the reference and select preserve row and or preserve column. Sometimes you want to reference a group of cells. This is called a range. You do this by reference of top left cell, colon, reference of bottom right cell. In this example, you see the sum function will range from B2 to B4. If you want to select a complete row or column, or even multiple rows and columns, use the same syntax, but you're only using the column name or row name. A range of multiple adjacent rows or columns can be selected with a colon between the top or left row or column and the bottom or right column or row. In this example, it is in the formula sum iPad colon iPhones. Now that you understand references, you know how to do all sorts of calculations with the numbers. Of course, you can use all the mathematical symbols for your equations and mixing and matching values and references. Where it gets really great is the large collection of functions. You can start using a function either by just typing an equal sign, followed by the name of the function, if you already know it, then autocorrection will help you here. You see that once you select the function, numbers will present the parameter names for that function as well as a description of what kind of value to input in the bottom row. Also, once you start typing an equal sign, you get the function's overview in the format menu enabled. Here you can select the function, group by category, and once you select the function, you can see a short description as well as some examples. Take a look around at the plethora of functions you have at your fingertips. You often use frozen row or column headers to make sure that with large tables, the important information will not scroll away. You can right click on any row or column header and select or deselect freeze. Okay, now let's talk about pivot tables. Pivot tables allow you to group, order, and manipulate your data by creating new tables from a source table. Let me show you an example. You see the sales data by location table I have. By selecting it, and then selecting pivot table from the menu, I create a new sheet called sales data by location pivot. In the organizer menu, you now can see the pivot options. Just watch what I do. I drag the location from fields into columns and the type from fields into rows. And then I select the years 2021 to 2023, which puts them into values in the pivot options. Now you see a different way of presenting the source data in a more extensive way. What gets interesting is that by pressing on the I symbol at any value, you can select different options to present or order the data. For instance, with a values field, I can select whether I want to present the sum, average, count, minimum, or maximum, and much more. Also, I can define whether I want to present the value or the percentage of the grand total or lots of other options here. I guess with this little example, you can see lots of cool options how you can use pivot tables to get a completely new look at your tables. A snapshot is a copy of your table that isn't affected by changes to the original data. The snapshot doesn't include formulas, categories, or hidden values, but does have the same formatting. This is particularly useful for copying a table to other apps, such as pages or notes. Using a snapshot is also a way to customize a pivot table. For example, you can use different labels or manually organize rows and columns. When you paste the snapshot, certain elements such as disclosure controls and hidden rows and columns are removed. Any changes you make to the original table won't change the data shown in the snapshot. How to create a snapshot? First, select the table. Second, in the numbers menu bar, choose edit copy snapshot. Third, paste the snapshot where you want it, such as in another sheet or another app, like for instance, Keynote. Depending on your selection of either the complete table, a column, a row, or some cells, the context menu will always give you quick access to sorting options, quick filters, and category options. You can hide or show columns and rows here, add columns and rows before or after the selected row or column, fit the width of a column to its content, and many more options. So check out the options by clicking on the table selector or the header or a column or a row. Also notice, that you can select multiple rows, columns or cells by using the modifier keys shift for selecting a continuous group or command for selecting 
multiple not adjacent rows, columns, or cells. Any changes within the format menu or the context menu will be applied to all selected elements. In the Organize menu, you can sort the entire table or selected rows. You select the column you want to sort by and whether it should be sorted, ascending or descending. You can have multiple sorting criteria. If you have a large dataset, filtering becomes crucial. You can add a filter to any table using the Organize menu in the Filters tab. You can only filter within columns. That means the values you filter for are depending on which group you selected. In the example, I add a rule for column D or 2023 where I filter for values which are greater than 10,000. You can have multiple rules for each columns and you can have multiple filters. That means you can filter by several columns. You can also switch a filter on and off here and define whether all filters should match or any one. Categories allow you to group rows into categories. Here's an example where I have sales figures for location and type. Watch what happens when I group using column B or type. I could now even hide the type column because it is reflected in the category. The format menu is the primary way to manipulate cells. When you select any element of a table, you can define the format for the complete table, like its general style, the number of headers, columns and rows, as well as footer rows. The general font size can define the outline border as well as the grid, whether the rows will be colored alternatively as well as manipulating the height and width of rows and columns. In the cell tab, you can define the data format as well as the filling of the cells and its border style. I will talk about conditional highlighting in a second. With the text tab, you define the font styling in all selected cells. You can select a predefined style or define all options individually. Once you have defined a text style, you can save it in the paragraph style menu, clicking on the plus symbol, or you can change an existing one here also. And the last tab, arranging, allows you to position the complete table in the back or front, which makes sense once you layer other elements on top of it. You can also lock the table here. Conditional highlighting is an option you find in the format menu under the cell tab. This allows you to add rules, which then would format the cell if matched. An often used example is to color the text or the cell background green if the value is greater than zero or red if it is below zero. You can use this with a function of copy and paste style to bring this conditional formatting to several groups of cells. Wow, that was a ride, right? Now you know everything you need to know to master the table object in numbers. If you like this video, please hit the like button. And if you don't want to miss out on more cool infos like this, please don't be too shy to hit the subscribe button as well. Many thanks. If you have stumbled over this video and want to get deeper into another great app from Apple, I recommend you take a look at my Freeform Masterclass using this link. So that's it for now. See you next time. Bye.